Hi, One Lit Teacher here to talk about the sonnet tradition and give you an overview of the three major types of sonnets. The sonnet tradition comes out of another tradition called courtly love or amour courtois in French. This is a medieval code of attitudes towards love. It's a knight's conduct towards a noble lady who is often married and it is love from afar. So think about all those fairy tales you probably read when you were a child, the Disney movies you watched. This is princesses and castles who need to be rescued by knights and uh, these knights slay dragons and so on. And the movie Shrek, for example, makes fun of this tradition. A more courtois developed from a mixture of traditions that came before it. For example, all the way back to ancient Greek and Roman beliefs, um, there was this idea that passionate love was either a punishment from the gods, like you'd been struck by Cupid's arrow and just simply gone mad, or a mere means of gratification and not to be taken seriously. In 11th century, there was Arab love poetry and lady worship. 12th century, the practices of medieval troubadours um, who went around singing about love and also the establishment of courts of love by Eleanor of Aquitaine and her daughter, Marie de Champagne, who commissioned a guy named Andreas Capellanus or Andrew the Chaplain to write a handbook with the rules and it was called the art of courtly love. And then in the 12th and 13th centuries, a tradition called Eve and Mary dualism also is in the background here. And I believe that this idea is still largely in place in our, in our um, cultures today. Unfortunately, the idea that women are either the pure Eve to be held on a pedestal, or they are Mary who is someone who leads men astray and is their downfall. So the sonnet is a 14 line poem written in iambic pentameter. And here I have some of the most famous sonneteers in literature. On the left is a statue of Petrarch, who was of course Italian and who developed the Petrarchan Italian sonnet tradition or is at least quite famous for, for um, writing them. And Petrarch lived in the 14th century. And then the most famous sonneteer in the English tradition is Shakespeare. In fact, we call the English sonnet, frequently call it the Shakespearean sonnet because he was a famous writer of those poems in the 16th and 17th centuries. And then off to the right, we have Sir Edmund Spencer who wrote sonnets in the 16th century. And I've left out Philip Sidney and, and some other famous sonneteers, but the, this is an overview of some of the writers and the three different types, the Petrarchan sonnet, the Shakespearean sonnet, the Spencerian sonnet. And you might be looking at the dates that I have on here and thinking there's a big gap between Petrarch, for example, and Spencer and Shakespeare. And that's because when your country is in political turmoil and people are killing each other, you don't tend to do things like sit down and write sonnets. So um, political turmoil in England, the War of the Roses and so on, kept this from coming to England um, until much later. So back to Petrarch. Petrarch wrote the Canonziere, again, please forgive my horrible pronunciations. Um, I'm pretty good with English. In English, the song book. This was a collection of over 300 sonnets written to the same woman. It was written in the Italian vernacular or the common language of the Italian people. And it was a two part sonnet form containing an octave, which is eight lines and a sestet, six lines with a volta or break in theme and or tone in between the octave and the sestet. So the octave pattern in a Petrarchan sonnet is always ABBA, ABBA, but the sestet can vary. It could be something like CD, 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 or CDE, DCE, CCD, CCD, and so on. There are lots of different variations. Interestingly, before I leave this slide, Think about the fact that Shakespeare wrote over 300 sonnets to the same woman. She was not his wife. She was already married to someone else. Hmm. All of Petrarch's sonnets consist, again, of the octave, ABBA, ABBA, and a sestet, which is a varied um, set of different patterns, but it is a pattern. Okay, so I'm not going to take the time to read this lovely sonnet to you right now, but this is Petrarch's sonnet six, tran in translation in English, of course, and it shows us this rhyme scheme. In this case, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, D, C, D, D. So as I mentioned, 
Petrarch wrote over 300 sonnets to this lovely lady named Laura, who was already married. He met her in church and he practiced with her amour courtois or love from afar. And the Petrarchan lady then becomes this sort of stereotypical lady whom you will recognize from those same fairy tales and Disney movies I already mentioned. These are the qualities of Laura. Although she was Italian, she was a Northern Italian woman who um, was very fair with hair golden like silk, skin and breasts like ivory or alabaster. Eyes, you can start to guess these because you know the pattern. Bright as the stars compared to heavenly bodies. And teeth like pearls. Lips, come on, you've got this. They're as red as cherries or wine. A throat as long and white as a swan. And cheeks like peaches. The Petrarchan lady also had some qualities that could be damaging to the Petrarchan lover. Um, her tears, which create floods that will drown the lover, her sighs that will blow the lover over and threaten his life, and a voice like an angel or a songbird. She is often compared to a castle, a fortress, or a temple, as she is seen as unattainable, pure, untouchable, virtuous. And just think about sort of the sexual symbolism of that. She's a fortress, unable to be um, scaled or entered. Um, she is sometimes thought of as, a dan as dangerous to the lover's well-being and cruel because she is faithful to another. By the way, in the picture here, this is a castle um, that may look a lot like the Cinderella castle because the Cinderella castle is based off of it. This is a real castle in the German Alps called Neuschwanstein, and I've been there. It's a fantastic place to visit if you ever have a chance, but this is really a typical idea of that fortress that represents the Petrarchan lady who becomes the princess and all the fairy tales that you know. The Petrarchan lover, the poet, is wounded by Cupid's arrow. He is hopelessly in love with the unattainable woman. He is the despondent victim of unrequited love. And unrequited just means unreturned love. And unrequited love then is a major theme in Petrarchan sonnets. He is willing to prove his love by performing insurmountable deeds. Think about those dragons that he needs to slay, for example. And he alternately praises and curses his lady in his poems. I'm going to pause here for a second again. The Petrarchan lover is in love with somebody else's woman. And today we would probably call him a stalker. But Petrarch became very famous for writing these kinds of poems, and so did some other English sonneteers, some who wrote both English sonnets and Petrarchan sonnets, um, such as Sir um, Philip Sidney, who wrote the Astrophel and Stella cycle, um, where he wrote all these different poems to this woman who had been betrothed to him basically when she was a child, and then later broke it off and married somebody else, a guy named Lord Rich. And then this woman, Penelope Devereux, um, was the subject of uh, over a hundred sonnets by Sydney. And again, today we might call that being a stalker. Okay, uh, Shakespeare makes fun of the Petrarchan sonnet tradition in a very famous poem, Sonnet 130, which begins, my mistress eyes are nothing like the sun. And, and he really kind of goes through that series of descriptions of the Petrarchan lady. Carl, coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked, red and white, but no such roses I see in her cheeks. And in some perfumes there is more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing, pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet by heaven I think my love is rare as any she belied with false compare. So for a moment we might think this poem is cruel and mean, but really what Shakespeare is saying is, I don't need that Petrarchan lady stereotype. I have a real woman who is not going to ever live up to that, but she is her own kind of beautiful. And so this is a fun poem. If you would like to see an actual analysis of this poem, you can see that on my YouTube channel, One Lit Teacher. Also, Shakespeare makes fun of the Petrarchan lover in Romeo and Juliet. Think of that poor Romeo, also another stalker who's peeking up into Juliet's balcony. 
Um, and he is already dead, according to Mercutio. Alas, poor Romeo, he is already dead, stabbed with a white wench's black eye, run through the ear with a love song, the very pin of his heart cleft with the blind bow boy's butt shaft. And is he a man to encounter Tybalt? Um, and there are many places in that play where I believe Shakespeare is just directly making fun of the Petrarchan lover. And again, I'll cover this in another video on one lit teacher. The English or Shakespearean sonnet, again made famous by Shakespeare himself, is a 14 line poem in iambic pentameter with a rhyme scheme A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. This is three quatrains and a rhyming couplet. The structure provides a framework on which to build words, phrases, themes, rhymes, syncopation, punctuation, and rhythm of the sonnet, making it a self-contained piece of art. Again, I have some videos talking about some of the more famous Shakespeare sonnets on my YouTube channel, One Lit Teacher. This is that same poem I just read aloud, Shakespeare's Sonnet 130, so I'm not going to read it again, but here you can see I have marked off the famous Shakespearean rhyme scheme, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Another very famous English sonneteer, not nearly as famous as Shakespeare, of course, but famous, is Sir Edmund Spencer. He also wrote 14-line poems in iambic pentameter, but this guy decided he was going to come up with his own unique sonnet structure. So his rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, C, D, C, D, E, E. This is an interlocking structure in which one quatrain is locked into the next and so on three quatrains and a rhyming couplet. It's more difficult to rhyme than the Shakespearean sonnet because there's just a larger number of rhyming words. It's also historically less important than the Italian, Petrarchan, or English Shakespearean sonnet. That's okay, Spencer, we still like you. Um, in fact, this is a very famous poem written by Edmund Spencer. One day I wrote her name upon the strand, and I will do an analysis of this poem in another video on my YouTube channel, One Lit Teacher. Please subscribe. Here's the rhyme scheme marked, though. A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, C, D, C, D, E, E. So Elizabethans, who wrote these sonnets much later than Petrarch, as I earlier mentioned, they really admired sonnets for their intrinsic beauty. And these poets valued the sonnet pattern as a challenge to their poetic skills. So one sonneteer was sort of trying to one-up the next, and sometimes they would even make references to each other's works in their poems. Um, they also did that in, in plays, but in their poems, kind of like rappers do today. Um, and this was um, kind of a sport even in Elizabethan England, and people would pass around these sonnets at the courts. I have a picture of Queen Elizabeth here, not only because many of these sonnets were written in the Elizabethan era, but because Queen Elizabeth herself um, wrote some sonnets. Oh, I almost forgot. Here's Sir Willip, uh, Philip Sidney. This is the guy I mentioned earlier who had been betrothed to um, Lady Devereux. And uh, this is a poem from that sonnet cycle called Astrophel and Stella, Star and Stargazer. Um, this, or Stargazer and Star, this kind of shows you that stalker mentality as well. This one is written as a Petrarchan sonnet with that ABBA octave and then the sestet. And I cover that poem in another video on my YouTube channel, One Lit Teacher. So if this was helpful to you or interesting to you, I hope you will subscribe to my YouTube channel, One Lit Teacher.